Shall we bow our heads? Are we ready, uh, brother? Thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of having this class to study how you uh, presented your message through the centuries and prepared the way for the final message. And I pray for your special blessing as we study today. In the name of Jesus, amen. <coughs> Now, the roots of our message began with Christ, his teaching and training of the disciples and organizing, therefore, the church by sending out his disciples and uh, bringing about the latter rain, early rain and so forth, the, and then from there we find a uh, period of terrible persecution. And you recall that that was stopped by Constantine who declared himself Christian, though he never was, and presided over the very, uh, mo some of the most significant uh, uh, church discussions and uh, uh, was the one who made the first Sunday Law, 321. Then those who were seeking to reform, the first ones we have record of are the Celts in Ireland and in Scotland. And uh, there were some very valiant people there. And uh, Iona was a, a community of missionaries that were sent all over different things at uh, different places. Eventually they were shut down by the Roman Catholic Church uh, and that is not a part of our study today but it's a very interesting but, but sad story. Then there were the Lollards and that's spelled L-O-L-L-A-R-D. I'm not sure what the typewriter was doing. <laughs> I'm sure the typist had in mind L-O-L-L-A-R-D, yes. Uh, Lollards, that was Wycliffe, uh, or Wycliffe, it's pronounced different ways. But Wycliffe was the early morning star of the Reformation, and that too you will study in another class. But he organized the Lollards who went throughout England preaching the gospel. And then later came the Waldenses and the Albigenses, or Albigenses. Following that was the, uh, well, I put here Protestant Reformation well, they, those should have been on two different lines, and I'm sorry I di didn't notice what had happened. Waldenses and Albigenses were before the uh, Protestant Reformation. And then during the Protestant Reformation, we had another Reformation inside the Reformation because the Reformers and their followers s started uh, uh, to... Uh, did what they could to stop the Anabaptist movement, which was a vital movement. Anabaptist means be baptized again. Simply means that they believed in adult baptism. So that when a person was sprinkled at infancy, they did not consider that to be a true baptism. And so they taught that we must be baptized as adults, and that was called believer baptism. The infants cannot believe. They do not have the concepts of, of everything. And following the Anabaptist movement was the Wesleyan revival. You'll notice how God brings about a revival, and then there is a falling away. A new revival, maybe a different place, falling away. Revival, falling away. 
This happened right from the very beginning of the apostolic church. You remember we had those who uh, uh, were uh, uh, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Christ said, I also hate. Nicolaitans taught that if you have faith in Christ, you don't need to worry about your, your behavior, your lifestyle. You, you, uh, you're accepted by him, whatever. And then over and over again, every time God raises up a movement, Satan invades it. And uh, thank the Lord, when he invades it, God prepares the way for bringing back his message. So that's basically what you have here, is efforts to restore the apostolic faith that never are really completed before Satan manages to bring about a new apostasy. The Wesleyan revival was very important in leading to the Millerite movement. We've already talked about the British Isles uh, movement and how it failed. But then there was a Wesleyan revival that uh, um, had followers in all over America and uh, Britain and other countries. But it was that Millerite movement that gave birth to, I'm sorry, it was the Wesleyan revival and movement that gave birth to the uh, Advent movement. Here in America, we call it the Millerite movement. And from that Millerite movement grew the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So notice we are a movement of prophecy and our movement goes right back. I followed it from Christ and the apostles this way. You can trace it, the book traces it the other way. From here uh, to the Millerite movement, to the Wesleyan movement, but now we're going back in history. So I turned it around and put it uh, so that we could uh, look from the beginning to our time. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the last movement. There are seven churches in Revelation, and uh, these churches relate to these various things that we're talking about here, and the La Laodicean movement is the last movement. I mean, I shouldn't say a Laodicean movement, but I mean the Laodicean church is the last church which must be reformed. God will not raise up another church or another group yet. It, it is for us to receive the final message which we will be focusing on, the Minneapolis message. But unless we do, we'll stay right here until we do, I should say, because God's people will ultimately do so. Prophetic statements indicate that that will happen, but whether we're a part of it or not determines by, is determined by us. We individually and as a group, God will not present another message. It's a message designed to prepare the world for his coming. Now, I wanted to go back to the beginning of the Protestant, Reform I mean, of the, not Protestant Reformation, but beginning of the Advent movement. There were people around the world who were studying the prophecy before this. But when Berthier took uh, the Pope prisoner, captive, and took him into uh, 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 France in 1798, this was like an electric shock that went around the world and signaled the end of the 1260-day prophecy and would soon lead to a shift from the 1260 to the 2300 day prophecy. Now we're going to give some thought to the climate 
Uh, this will be kind of erratic because we're going to cover several different types of movements that were taking place. When God sets about to bring about a revival, reformation, there's almost always things that he sees too that take place throughout the world to prepare the people. God seeks to prepare the general population for the message that he is going to bring. At the same time, Ellen White said, before a true revival, before a true message, what is going to happen? The false, and this does happen. So one of the things we're going to see is evidence that both powers were seeking to prepare the people both Christ and Satan. And uh, one of the sects, many, many sects that developed, uh, this one began in 1694, which was over a century before Berthier was taken captive. But this was called the Woman in the Wilderness. And it was a German community that settled in Philadelphia. And then there were the German dunkers, which means uh, Baptists. Dunkers, they dunk them into the water. In other words, the German Baptists. Conrad Beisel uh, was rejected. He was a part of, of a commune, and he was rejected, so he formed his own <clears throat> in which he taught the seventh day was the Sabbath. And by the way, what about the Anabaptists? What were their teachings? Well, I don't have time to, to study the Anabaptists, but they believed in not only baptism, they be, most of them believed in the seventh-day Sabbath. They were actually, they were early Seventh-day Adventists. And now we find Beisel teaching that the seventh day is the Sabbath. He denied eternal punishment and was opposed to war and actually began a two meal a day plan, which was early, uh, an early reform movement. Yes. Where, where are some like, resources that actually give the history of some of these? I think you'll find those in the book. This, by the way, ta is taken from the first two chapters of Light Bearers, and I'm sure you'll find the sources there. Notice how there are various reforms that start up, and most of these forms, uh, they die out eventually, but there's early efforts on the part of God to bring back the truth, and at the same time, the efforts of Satan to use the truth to deceive. So the mixing, when you mix truth and error, what do you have? Truth or error? It's always error. And that's what error is. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you mix truth and evil, that is the nature of evil. Then there was the prophetess Jemima Wilkinson. Do you notice that we have women involved in these uh, efforts, these early efforts? Uh, what was the ultimate resu result of women's involvement in these early efforts? To a large degree, it was to inoculate people against Ellen White the true prophet. Mm -hmm. Now these were almost always, in fact they virtually always were, uh, a mixture of truth and error. So when you have a mixture of truth and error, what do you have? Error. error. But we do need to recognize that some of these people were reaching out for truth. This is in the year of 1776, when we became a nation. Now, Jemima claimed to have had a 36-hour trance 
in which Christ occupied her body and uh, the, she uh, claimed that she was the manifestation, the human manifestation of Christ and that she would exist for a thousand years. Now, of course, it's been a long, long time ago since she died. But this is part of it. She called herself the universal friend. Now, this is a case where Satan undoubtedly uh, was using someone who was spiritually oriented in some way and uh, made, uh, been able to capture her and use her for, for error instead of truth. She also believed in the Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Sabbath, but did not keep it. She did not consider it necessary. Then there was Mother Ann Lee Stanley, another woman. And she was the founder of the Shaker movement, which, by the way, is a spiritualistic movement. She taught the celibacy, that there should no, be no uh, marriage, and no union between man and woman. And she also taught the equality of sexes, which means she was an early forerunner of the women's lib movement. She claimed to be the female incarnation of God. Do you notice that the two of these ladies identified themselves as one, the female representation, representative of the, of the Godhead, and the other, that she was, her body was the host to Christ. But notice what else she, she taught. They were known for their industry, their temperate living, but also very strange dances. John Humphrey Noyes focused on perfection. Have you ever heard of that word? What did you hear? <laughs> you heard a lot of heat, didn't you? Yeah. Well, actually, this generation that you're in knows nothing about that heat. There has been heat, mm. such as you would not even hardly recognize. In other words, much greater than anything you've seen. But it's still, still a hot subject. There, this is what split the church into liberals and conservatives. Conservatives insisting on perfection, liberals denying perfection. Liberals insisting that the church is legalistic because of its focus on perfection, and those who focus on perfection insisting that this is essential before Christ can come. So what we have is a great deal of conflict and it involves the nature of Christ as well, which we won't pursue now. But let me say this, neither side, in my opinion, has portrayed the truth adequately. Both sides are defending something very important and both violate the opposite paradoxical balance. Truth is paradoxical. Truth always is balanced. When people do not recognize the balance, they become unbalanced, and we call them extremists or other, other words. And usually what has happened is that they focus on part truth and make it the whole of truth. Therefore, as they do, they actually deny the truth they're proclaiming as well as the one they're opposing. Because paradoxical truth must be fused and the paradoxical principles, those that appear to be opposite, are actually essential to each other. Neither one of them can stand alone. And if you, if you reduce either one, you've reduced the other because they're interdependent. We'll discuss that again in, later. But remember, paradoxic, that truth is paradoxical. And we need to learn how to think paradoxically. 
Do not allow your, your opponent to determine what you believe. What happens in conflict is that if, if party A teaches something like, uh, well, like uh, perfection, Par party B, their very great purpose in life will be to destroy that. If, if party B is teaching uh, that there is no such thing as perfection, then it will be the great sense of commitment and duty on the part of the other to, uh, to get rid of the ones who, who, who oppose perfection. The fact is, I think we'll be able to, before we have finished the class, we will understand this better. But the fact is both sides are standing for important principles. And they're both violating principles. And brothers and sisters, I must say that the church does tend, the conservative element of the church does tend toward legalism not intentionally and not necessarily because of what they believe is wrong but because they're not balanced there is not the adequate balance they do not bring this together with another uh, balancing truth well Humphrey Noyes uh, denied organ, uh, uh, ordination which means that he was in sympathy more with the uh, brethren element. He also taught sinless conversion, uh, sinlessness at conversion, which is a very serious problem because conversion begins the process of character development. It does not terminate it. And uh, when a person believes that sinlessness is the product of conversion, they cannot understand their own experience. They either decide they were not converted or they must develop some false concept of conversion. Otherwise, they're left feeling hopeless. And by the way, this is what ultimate uh, uh, conservative position, the extreme conservative position leaves a person without security and it leaves them without Christ and uh, we'll discuss those things later uh, he developed a communist colony in Putney now you'll notice that the efforts of Satan over and over again follow a certain pattern and always there are good things about what Satan does otherwise he would not be able to deceive people as this and by the way just a, a couple of minutes on com, com, communism is is communism good or bad it's good on paper well don't say good and don't say bad because communism the philosophy of communism, not talking about the, the details, but the, the uh, idea of sharing is wonderful. And the idea that we are equal and that we, uh, that we share with one another. But where you have sinfulness, mm -hmm. communism cannot operate because those who uh, uh, become the leaders in the communists become the controllers. And they become, there's much more uh, tyranny because, especially compared with the democracy, because there's a, there's a con continual restraints within democracy. In communism, the leadership can do, if they gain power, they can do whatever they want to do. And the common person has no more significance in communism than they do in the Roman Catholic system. So communism, yes, has a lot of really good 
uh, good elements that make it look good, but it can't operate. There is no way for communistic principles to function as they are presumed to in a world of selfishness and sin. Oh, he also taught complex marriage. What is complex marriage? <laughs> Ladies, what's complex marriage? Polygamy. Huh? Polygamy. Well, it's a certain kind of polygamy. Well, I mean, yes, it is a polygamy, yes, but a certain kind. It means that every woman has to be married to every man. And that's a pretty strange thing. Well, they were driven out of town because of that eventually, and eventually they decided that may not be a good principle. So they gave it up eventually. But you can see how Satan uses the desire of man. Now, there is God implanted within the human psyche the desire for marriage. Well, if you can marry one woman, well, then why not, you know, all many women? Uh, actually, the notice how the women are left actually as as uh, being controlled not by one man, but by many. <laughs> then there was the Latter-day Saints, a young man, 14 years of age, dreamed of preparing the world for Christ's second coming. He was going to, he was going to purify the uh, society and prepare for Christ's coming. In 1830, uh, is there any significance to that year, 1830? Miller started preaching in 1831, but by 1830 he was under continual internal struggle over the need to preach and he didn't feel like he could. So this was just before the Millerite movement started, but as the English movement began, uh, 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 by that time, the movement in England had been taken over by Derby and uh, was no longer a, a true movement. It was a false movement. So now, what does Satan do? Before, he knows God's prophecies better than any of us do. And before God's plan take, can be put into operation, he puts a counterfeit there and follows it up with many other counterfeits. Now, there was no real interest in, uh, in Joseph Smith's message uh, where he lived. So they moved from place to place, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and uh, they actually developed missionaries to go forth. And what does a missionary movement do to the, to the body? it intensifies their focus. Mm -hmm. And so it was that uh, the Latter-day Saints, which came to be called, or Mormons, uh, by the way, what was the, uh, what was it that young um, Smith, what was it that was the basis for his launching his movement. He supposedly saw some, some visions. He claimed to have found uh, some plates, Egyptian plates, on the mountain. And the angel Moroni came to him and explained to him that these plates had God's message and that he was to translate these plates. And so when he translated the plates, he had his friend outside the curtain. That he was, he was enclosed in a curtain. So he presumably was reading these plates. His friend was writing down, and that's where we get the Book of Mormon. 
so from the, uh, the plates as administered through him and his friend. Now it's interesting that his friend was not permitted to see him at work. And uh, those who have examined those Egyptian plates find no indication of Egyptian language. But Satan deceives both by miracle and by just plain deception. It doesn't matter to him either way, just so people accept so are his... So really plates? Yes, what? Are there really some plates? Uh, I, apparently there are, the golden plates. I don't know. Uh, I, I understand they have been translated, so there must be. Or I mean they've attempted, no, 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 not translated, but they've attempted to identify the, the language there. Uh, and uh, there, there is not the capacity for doing that. Now, by 1844, there was a principle of Smith that was getting them into big trouble. And that was polygamy. And uh, Smith had the uh, authority to take any wife he wanted. If it happened to be somebody else's wife, then too bad that person would have to yield to divine, to, to, to the divine agent, which he claimed to be. Well, by 1844, in, in that year, he uh, decided he was going to run for president of the United States. And that running for president of the United States, of course, gave him more visibility and so forth. And the governor uh, of, of the uh, Illinois uh, had him arrested and put in jail. And uh, it was uh, in, while he was in jail on June 27, 1844, that the jail storm took place. The people who were after him broke into the jail and killed him. So that was the end of Smith. When Smith was gone, Brigham Young took over, and uh, he was going to lead them to the New Zion. And this New Zion was the valley of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, it's interesting that he, he took them that far away into that desolate country. <laughs> but uh, perhaps he felt that they'd be safe there and would not be attacked by others whose sensibilities they offended. Now we're going to deal with the fact that spiritualism was given its birth before the Advent movement as well, or I should say before the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And <clears throat> Emanuel Swedenborg, uh, and today there are different uh, groups that teach Swedenborg philosophy. It, it, it was a claim that uh, it was the true disclosure of book Revelation, and they had communication with ancient men of the past. Now, two of these men were physicians, Galen and Swedenborg. And these men claimed to teach them from the spirit world. And uh, there was a, a great deal of interest in the spiritual manifestations. Uh, they became involved in clairvoyance and spiritualistic trance. It was during this time, 1840, 1848, that the Fox sisters uh, and the rapping in Hydesville, New York took place. And uh, it wasn't long until there were thousands of spiritualists this re rapidly throughout the country. At, in 1848, uh, soon after this, there were estimated 350,000 uh, spiritualists in, uh, in New York. And New York alone. So 
tremendous number of people came and gave their lives to this false uh, message. They were, um, they were to hold, hold communion with the dead so they could talk to their loved ones and so forth. This is, of course, a standard spiritualistic phenomenon. Now we turn to the missionary movements. God was at work as Satan was at work. And in the various changes that took place, we see evidences. Some, this is God's movement, some it's Satan's movement, and some the uh, Satan has penetrated so that it becomes Satan's movement because it's a mixture of good and evil. But in 1740s, there was a... Uh, great awakening by the Wesley movement that I talked about before. Uh, and Charles Finney was also a great preacher at that time. They had different formats and so forth, but they were all part of a, of a united movement. In 1793, William Carey left for India. 95, the London Missionary Society was formed. In 96, the New York Missionary Society. Notice Europe and England are usually ahead of the U.S. at this time, and U.S. America follows along shortly thereafter. Now, Robert Morrison went to China. We know almost all of these men. Henry Martin to the Muslim area. Adoniram Judson to India, and Robert Moffat to South America, South Africa. These have become quite famous. Now, the Bible societies that were formed to support the mission, missions was really amazing. From 1804 to 1840, only 36 years, there were 63 different Bible societies that were formed and they translated the language into 112 languages and dialects. That was tremendous activity. They didn't have the, uh, the printing facilities we have, certainly not the uh, computerized. And it was really a, a challenge, but they accomplished a great deal in a short time. It was in 1804, the beginning of that, the British and Foreign Bible Society was formed and eight years later when the American went. Meantime, uh, Robert Rakes of England began the Sunday School movement. Now, most of you probably just assume that the Sunday School movement has always existed because we talk about Sunday School. Well, in the um, early 1800s, there were no Sunday Schools. Children either came uh, with their parents or were likely to have been left with somebody at home, but there was no Sunday schools. 1816, uh, the uh, New York and Boston. In uh, Philadelphia, it wasn't very long before there were 723 schools, Sunday schools. And then, by 1826, the various denominations had become involved, and they uh, formed the Home Missionary Society. Now, during this period of time, there were great economical changes. It was the, during the Industrial Revolution, re, uh, revolution and uh, the factories brought people into the urban areas so that if drawing them from the, from the country into the cities. So as a result, you could communicate with a lot more people a uh, lot more quickly because there were many people. Instead of a farm here and a farm there, there were hundreds of people in a very small area. Also, because of the Industrial Revolution, there was a great deal more money available for missions. And this was good in a way, and it's, but the economics 
growing as it was, really had some negative uh, implications because the wealthy and the poor became farther and farther apart. Those big businessmen who made the big money and then those who labored uh, 12 to 16 hours a day just for survival. It was during this time that there was a sense of urgency for reform on the labor side as the people were usually too tired to stay awake in church. So the result was a, a focus on reforms. Charles Finney not only preached the gospel of salvation, he preached the reform and claimed that the slavery system was evil. And uh, Miller uh, is an example of the union of temperance movement and the anti-slavery movement. Miller uh, was uh, one of the early temperance and anti-slavery uh, uh, advocates. Samuel Hall uh, decided that the teachers needed to be trained. Can you imagine teachers not being trained? And so they formed the uh, teacher training schools. Thomas Gallaudet and Samuel Howe Howe, Howe, uh, were determined to provide education for the blind and for the deaf. Don't you think that's wonderful? That they took an interest in those early years? Now we have within our church, just within the last few years, we've greatly intensified our focus on the deaf. We have focused quite a long while on the blind. But uh, uh, we are now focusing more on the deaf. And I happen to be, uh, have had the privilege of baptizing the man who's leading out in that. And Larry, and for some reason his name, last name doesn't come to me, but, but uh, I had the privilege of baptizing him when he was 16 years of age. Dwight, Louis Dwight uh, advocated for prison reform. You know, God is a reformer. His people are led to reform. But notice how God leads individuals here and there. There may not be a, yet a union, but he stimulates these different reforms. But God raised up a movement. He intended to combine all of these reforms. Uh, some of you probably had in mind that some of these reforms at least were uh, developed peculiarly by the Adventist Church. But the, really I'm not thinking right now of any reform that we have uh, promoted that we actually invented. God raised up in advance people to prepare the way for his manifold reformation. In the meantime, there were many educational reforms. Samuel Hall advocated for free education. At that point, the, if a person got education, it was probably from some church. Uh, and uh, very few people really were educated. Horace Mann was the first state superintendent who was appointed by a state to be a superintendent of education. Actually, right now I could wish he had never been. <laughs> uh, but God has used the system in various ways, but right now, brothers and sisters, I am very concerned about the educational, public educational system because the homosexual movement has cornered the leadership of the educational department and uh, it is a horrific and, and shameful thing that our children be given before grade school are being taught that homosexuality is normal and it's just another way of life. And if they get what they really want, then this will be required education everywhere.
Horace Mann, which we mentioned before, and uh, Henry Barnard of Connecticut were the ones who worked together to improve the buildings that the schools were in and have a, a standard in which they were required. If they have a school, it has to meet these certain standards. That can be good and it can be bad, but it is basically a good idea to assure that children are not going to be an overheated, un, uh, unventilated, you know, type of a, a building with crowded into too small an area. Those are some of the things that have been um, uh, uh, improved. The term of of uh, the school year was way too short. It was lengthened, and uh, normal schools were developed. I mentioned about education. They called these normal schools. These are teacher training schools. And the salaries of the teachers were increased so that there were many benefits. Uh, meanwhile, feminism, feminism is not new. And uh, Margaret Fuller and Lucy Stone were the two prominent leaders and who were fighting for equal rights in education for women and uh, that the women uh, would be able to enter any profession they chose and that they would be able to control, uh, pro uh, control property. As you remember, at that time, women did not own property, pardon me. It's the husband that owned the property. And if the woman didn't have a husband, too bad, she can't own any property. Now, there are a lot of abuses and misuses of God's plan for the male to be the leader. However, Satan brings about distortions in order to, that he can come along and have reformations that will actually destroy the home. The purpose of God is declared by creation at Eden. God created men and women different. He did not create them to do the same thing he created them both with responsibilities and they were equal in God's sight, but the women have a different role that God gave to them at creation itself. Now, and coming back to the reformers, the women's reformers, they made it clear that women voices would be heard uh, on public issues. Until then, a woman really was not expected to have any voice in the public. Then the health reform. By the way, I need to watch this because we have another whole chapter to consider. But the health reform. Have you ever heard of graham crackers? Well, that was Sylvester Graham's contribution. He became a vegetarian and he advocated a vegetarian diet with coarse grains. And that's exactly what our New Start program would love to have here. As a matter of fact, we do. Uh, I think personally we could have coarser grains yet, but we do move in that direction. And uh, Amherst College and Dartmouth, I don't know if you've heard of those, but Edward Hitchcock and Reuben Mussey uh, also developed a plan, vegetarian diet, no liquor, no tea, no coffee, no tobacco, no greasy foods, and uh, with exercise. Doesn't that sound a lot like New Start? <laughs> yes, so did we invent all of those? No, but God did send a prophetess to urge us to apply these principles and to develop a network of principles such as we might call New Start. Also hydrotherapy came from Australia, I'm, I'm sorry, from Austria. During this time, the one reform movement that grew most rapidly was the abolition of slavery. William Lloyd Garrison was the, uh, uh, was the publisher of the Liberator magazine. 
and this was sent all over advocating the freedom of the slaves. Charles Finney, as we mentioned before, equated slavery with sin. And during that time, during the 30s, when Ellen White was a, a prime a elementary student, during which time, the 30s, in which she received her, her injury, during that period of time, um, the anti-slavery movement grew and prospered. But there was uh, Postmaster General Postmaster General Amos Kendall, who uh, uh, made it sure that no uh, liberator magazines or anything like that would ever be delivered in the southern states. He uh, was able to secure uh, a, a decision by Congress to prevent the delivery of abolitionist material. In 1840, the Liberty Party was formed, and J.Q. Adams, John Quincy Adams, vigorously fought the gag rule, which was designed to prevent petitions from the people to reach Congress. God uh, had caused the Americans to place in the Constitution rights of the people, including to petition government. But Congress decided they didn't like that idea. They wanted to run that themselves. And so they had a gag rule which would permit them to, to prevent these petitions from coming. And the President Adams would determine that they would have the privilege of, uh, of petitioning Congress, which, uh, so that he spent much of his uh, political time fighting the gag rule. Now, as the anti-slavery or abolitionist movement grew and developed, almost all of the other uh, reforms faded because the anti-slavery became so dominant that the others were not able to survive. Some of them survived, but they were uh, only a small part of what they were before. Meanwhile, travel, communication. Daniel says, speaking of our day, men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Certainly the running to and fro is great. In 1811, steamboats appeared on the Mississippi River. In 48, the uh, F.B. Morse sent a message from Washington to Baltimore the first time anyone was able to communicate at a distance like that and you know the results. Today we have, what do we call it? Cell phones. Huh? Cell phones, Cell phones, yes, but I was thinking of the internet. Yeah. And of course that makes, uh, I guess the cell phone is involved with that. But we have so many means of communication. Anything that happens, dramatic things that happen at any point in the world, can be spread within seconds around the world. And never before in the history of mankind have we had such communication. In the meanwhile, democracy was developed. In uh, the 1820s and 30s especially, the two main powers, Britain and the US, uh, were f opposing kingship. And uh, here in America, we uh, established a constitution that would guarantee there was no kingship. And by the way, that constitution is being, well, what should we say? Not just ignored, but repudiated mm -hmm. right before our eyes. And this is what Ellen White said would happen. Every principle of our constitution, she says, will be what? repudiated. How fast it's happening. Now the revolutions in Europe of 1830 and 1848 
were involved, and that was involved a spirit of nationalism in which each nation was seeking to develop its own uh, intense loyalty to that nation as against any other uh, authority. Religious ideas and political ideas were being born and, and usually died soon after, but this was the area. Now we're going to have to run quickly about the Great Advent Movement. I would like to make a statement before I do. You do not have to remember all these names. I wanted to take time to go through. The book has given a good summary. I wanted to make sure that all of you had a clear understanding that the various reforms of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, none of them were introduced by Seventh-day Adventists. Now, many of us have had the idea that Ellen White was responsible for all these reforms. The fact is, these reforms came, many of them, when she, before she was born and in her infancy. But God did bring a movement into existence which would combine all of the valid reforms. And every reform is valid, is vital, and should be given attention. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to be talking about is the Advent movement, particularly in America. The Advent movement, of course, has to do with the Advent of Christ. Edward Gibbon stated that the reason, one of the key reasons for the Christian message to go around the world was its focus on the second coming of Christ. But very early, Satan began to pervert that concept. Origen, for instance, and uh, I think of Origen as the one he really didn't introduce or originate most of his ideas, but he's the one who really uh, intensely turned the church theologically around, and his views uh, had a great deal to do with the beginning of the, the Roman Catholic Church later on. But he spiritualized the second coming and he said that whenever a person was born again, whenever they were converted, uh, that was Christ's coming to him. So he spiritualized it so that no one would really take seriously the actual coming of Christ. Then in the 5th century, a couple of hundred years later, St. Augustine, again, he was a compiler. He, was, he, he, uh, he actually is considered to be the, uh, by the Roman Catholic Church, he is considered to be their father more than any other. He's the one who organized uh, their theological concepts and so forth. He's the one that introduced infant baptism many other things of that kind. But at any rate, he argued that the millennium began at the first advent. advent. If that had been true, and uh, if Christ, as the claim, would by the end of that millennium take over completely the whole world, then that would have happened uh, a thousand years of, over a thousand years ago. It didn't happen and it was not according to scripture. Now there was an early interest in the centuries that followed. Joachim of Flores in 1180 uh, introduced Daniel and Revelation from Daniel Revelation evidence of the second advent and began to focus attention on Christ's coming, soon coming. The Protestant Reformation brought a great deal of focus to the second coming. The Protestant reformers believed that they were advance agents prepared for the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> then Satan was very concerned and he decided to present a wonderful message by Daniel Whitby of 
the spiritual coming of Christ. And this theory of Whitby's, which was called Whitbyism, uh, actually was the dominant theory for about a thousand years. And so everyone just assumed that Whitbyism, that was, that was Bible truth. He believed that at the end of the thousand years, the Catholics and Protestants uh, and uh, even the Jews and the Muslims would be converted. Then we come to the French Revolution, and we've already mentioned that, which stimulated a close Bible study in which Whitbyism was removed from the focus, in fact, in which they challenged Whitbyism, and those that most diligently opposed the uh, Advent movement, uh, most of them, or many of them were uh, Whitby followers. In Germany, in 1768, Johann Petri, a German Calvinist, uh, had determined that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days were related. Now, you have grown up believing that, but let me just notice here, uh, later on we will have opportunity of, of focusing on this again. But notice uh, the uh, 70 weeks would be 490 days or years. And uh, from the date of, of um, 457, which was calculated to be the time when the uh, 70 weeks started, from that time till the baptism of Christ would be what? 69 and a half weeks, which would bring us to 20, uh, to 30, 31. The beginning of the, the 69 weeks would be 27. When Christ began to preach, he was crucified in 31, and the end of the 70 weeks would take us to 34 AD. Now, when you subtract 490 from 2300, how many years difference is there? Eighteen ten, and this was an important key to link these because the four hundred ninety was only a part of a longer period, which began in four fifty seven and would last until well eighteen. Most of the folk thought it would be eighteen forty, uh, eighteen forty seven, and then they began to have eighteen forty three. There were two problems that caused them to date them differently than Miller later did. And the first problem was that uh, they assumed that the ADBC dates were determined by uh, the, the birth of Christ. And Christ actually was born when they calculated these dates, they put the, that which is 4 BC. So there are four years before Christ was born that the A.D. dates would cover. The other was that there's no one or zero, I should say. Uh, there's no zero year. So you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. and that's two years with only one uh, unit. In other words, it should be one to zero to one. So one year, two years. Instead, it's one year. And therefore, they had over the world, was generally, if it wasn't 1847, it was 1843. And the 1847 date included both of those problems. And when these problems were resolved, the, the uh, timing was 1844.
Hans Wood was an Irishman who began the uh, 70 weeks and 2300 days in 420 and ended them in 1880. But it actually, though the, the timings were different, they're working on the same basic principles. But when you start it at 420 instead of 457, you're going to end up with a different date on the other end. Johann Bengel, a German pastor, was fascinated with the years 666 and the 1260 years, and he uh, identified coming of Christ in 1836. Well, the purpose of these, you don't have to remember all these names, but you do need to remember the kind of circumstance and the kind of reasoning that took place. And remember that even though they came to different dates, they basically were, most of them were dealing with the same issues and on the same principles, but with some lack of information. He also, by the way, taught a millennial reign on earth that would begin a thousand years on earth and then a thousand years in heaven with a resurrection at the time the thousand years begins and a thousand and then then for the other thousand years in heaven to begin just before the heavenly thousand years. We've already talked about Manuel Lacunza, and we found that uh, Manuel Lacunza was a, a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest who wrote the book that caused Darby and his followers to shift from the Daniel's historicist principles to futurism from a day for a year to a day for a day, from the papacy having been the Antichrist to the, to the Antichrist being yet future. <clears throat> and he wrote that under the pen name Ben Ezra because he knew that the Catholic Church would certainly be after him. And as it was, he instructed that his book be published after his death, which it was, but it wasn't long before it came under the papal ban because the papacy will not, would not be happy with that. Now, it did happen that, that he did believe in two resurrections with a thousand years between, and that in particular interested the followers, uh, uh, the brethren, and caused them to actually shift from historicist to a futurist position. I think we will pass this when we've gone before, talked about the Anglican Journal, uh, the Christian Observer, and uh, 1810 with John Brown coming up with 457, 1843. I want to say a few more words about Edward Irving. I, I can see by one or two of the papers that at least some of you didn't uh, realize that uh, Irving was not a brethren. Irving cooperated with the brethren. He was friends of the key leaders. They worked together. He was an Adventist. He was proclaiming the Advent message, but he himself was a uh, ordained minister in, in the uh, Anglican Church, who was actually put out later on, removed from ministry because of the fact that uh, tongue speaking broke out in uh, his church. And uh, there was faith healing. And this caused a, a great deal of confusion because the tongue speaking was not a Pentecostal sprung tongue speaking, but I'm, true, I'm talking about the true Pentecost. It was before Pentecostalism developed, but it was a, a uh, counterfeit, and when he was asked to repudiate that movement, he refused to do so because he feared that he might be interfering with the work of the Spirit. In other words, he did not know 
whether this was genuine or not, but his refusal to repudiate it caused him to be removed from uh, the church, from the pastorate. He died in 1834, which was uh, shortly after Miller's movement began. Now, I already talked to you about Henry Drummond, who was a banker, who uh, uh, was a wealthy man, and uh, he changed from political efforts to religious efforts as a result of the influence and the urging of Lewis Way, which we didn't mention, was one of the men to influence him by urging him to use his estate as the, as the um, place for holding uh, prophecy meetings. And so as a result, in 1826, he invited both laymen and ministers to, who were interested in studying prophecy to come, and they spent a week uh, studying prophecies, but it was that that gave Darby, who had just been introduced to Lacunza, it gave him, as he began to digest Lacunza's work, it gave him a platform for teaching futurism, and by the 1830, the last of those meetings, that group had changed to, from historicist to futurist. Again, notice 1847 is still, and that has to do with the calculation of the dates. Joseph Wolfe uh, went all over the world preaching the Advent movement, uh, Advent message, I should say. So he actually spoke in Congress. He was asked to speak to Congress. And he, he took the message to, uh, to the... Um, Muslim world, and to many, in fact, all over the world. Now, there were a number of other key individuals. You don't need to remember all, what all of them were. Be sure, as you come to the individuals that are most prominent within Adventism, give more attention to them. But you do need to know how God led in preparing the way for the Seventh-day Adventist movement even before the Sabbath was, well, the Sabbath was here and there, but not as an organized movement. And then we had individuals in Australia. Playford uh, preached on the second coming of Christ and the local churches were not big enough to house him, so he had to build a large structure so that he would have a place for people to come. And then we have Daniel Wilson, who was preaching 1847 as well. Now, the book I have in black, the statements which they indicated was why the work in British Isles did not succeed as it did in America. I have put the most important in red. Now, it is true that... Uh, there was a lot of argument, more argument in the British Isles over when the 2300 days ended, and therefore uh, there was no unity uh, on, on saying, well, this is it, and Millerites reduced it to one date. And that was focused the attention and caused the disappointment to be the greater, by the way. But they also focused on the restoration of the Jews and the rebuilding of the temple and uh, the expulsion of the Muslims from, the, from Palestine. Now, <clears throat> this is today, when our movement started, this was a real issue, and we will deal with the daily issue toward the end of our course, which is a very serious issue within the church with debate over which was the daily, and it was... Ellen White's statement in, re, in, in uh, urging the believers not to go to, to old Jerusalem and not to send their money there that caused this debate to take place. And we'll come to that later. But uh, there was no mass gathering in England and uh, there were no popular journals which developed in America. 
And uh, but, but what was the most significant reason why the failure of the British Isles? It was because of Derby and the change from historicism to futurism. They lost their zeal. They lost their vision uh, entirely and were looking forward to an unknown time when a papal prelate would arise and do these things. I see it's time for us to conclude and we have covered most of what I wanted to. We will be dealing with Miller tomorrow or Monday and uh, the rest of these uh, just a little outline would you find it in your book actually uh, of the different factors and we will uh, deal with Miller himself uh, on Monday. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you Lord for your many blessings. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for the evidence that you prepare the world. You prepared the world for the first coming of Christ. You have prepared the world for your messages in between and now you have been preparing the world for the final message. I pray that you'll help us to understand that message and to be involved in it. In the name of Jesus, amen.